122 million children in the Asia-Pacific region between the ages of 5 and 14 work for a living. That's about half the global total, according to the International Labour Organization. The good news is that between 2000 and 2004, those numbers fell by 11 percent. And the ILO says the end of the worst forms of child labour is in sight. I'm Taymor Nabili, and on this edition of 101 East, we ask, will Asia's rapid economic growth finally eliminate the need for child labor? Perhaps one of the worst places a child could end up working is on one of the Jamals of North Sumatra. These are fishing platforms, basic wooden structures, four hours from dry land where they end up working for months at a time for less than a dollar a day. Chantao Cho reports. Fifty kilometers off the coast of North Sumatra, Indonesia. These are some of the boys who work on rickety fishing platforms called Jamals. Under Indonesian law, it's illegal for those under 18 to work on Jamals. This one we found had four workers who looked like teenagers with two older men. All four claimed to be at least 18. The average age of the children is around 14 until 17. The commitment of the, of the government to eliminate uh, of the child labor in the German is very uh, weak now. They are satisfied that, that uh, the number of the German decrease, they wait until Jamal destroy by the nature. Nadiman is the smallest of the lot and probably the youngest. According to Jamal tradition, the youngest cooks for the rest. He's been here since January this year. In my village, there are jobs but the salary is very low. It is less than 20 US dollars a month for working in a rubber plantation. Here, it's about 30 US dollars. None of them will see the money until they leave the Jamal after working for at least three months on it. Because the owners provide vegetables and rice supplies every fortnight, they have to stay at least three months. For Nadiman, his contract is for a year. If he's lucky, he'll be allowed to visit home in September for Ramadan, the Muslim fasting month. By then, he would have been on the Jamal for nine months without seeing dry land. Every day I'm working, doing the same thing. It's not boring but very tiring. I would work in the village if I could find a good job there. Then I can also be near my family. I miss them but because I work here, I must try not to think about them. It's interesting here but I would like to go back to school if I can. His foreman Bawo, who returns to mainland every three weeks, is also responsible for recruiting labor for the Jamal. The parents bring the children to me to ask for a job. So I say, if you want to send your children to the Jamal, then of course we need labor. I know the minimum age to work in a Jamal is 18. If the parents come to me, I will ask whether the child is 18. If they say yes, I believe them. It depends on what the parents say, not how old the boy looks. Some even beg me to employ their children as there is no job in their village. Life on a Jamal is tough for these boys. The catch is hauled up using a traditional winching mechanism. The rest of their work includes boiling the fish, drying and grading them. 
So at night, everyone crowds around this corner to watch a tiny television powered by the generator for the connection to the world outside. That world is at least a four-hour boat ride away, which is also how far they have to travel if they need medical help. I once stepped through a hole while drying fish and injured my leg. There was blood. I cleaned it with my shirt, had a short rest and started working again. I was new. Nobody told me about safety. They can't be attending school um, if they're on these platforms. They're isolated and it's not a good environment for them. It's almost uh, like imprisonment. They walk from morning until afternoon, until evening, and morning walking again. There is no rest. There is just a little time for resting and for relax. This is slavery. It's half past four in the morning and a thunderstorm has just passed. And these guys are up again like clockwork. The sad fact is, these workers said they would rather be here simply because their families need the money and they don't have better options in their villages. The complete solution would be to eradicate uh, poverty, um, but uh, that probably is not going to happen. Somehow the answer to that problem lies in both awareness raising about the importance of giving people a good start in life through an opportunity for a basic education and also practices of good governance. As for the central government in Jakarta, there appeared to be a lack of ability to exert control and change the situation. We have labour inspectors to monitor this problem but there are only 1,600 of these inspectors spread all over Indonesia to monitor all the companies. Not many are penalised for the breach of child labour laws. I think it's because local authorities are not ready to take on more work if the cases go to court, so they prefer to stay quiet. We make the policies, but the implementation is down to the local government. Ten years ago, there were more than a thousand Jamals employing some 400 underage workers. Today, about 50 are left, and the people working on them seem to have been forgotten. This Jamal is more than 20 years old. With a lack of wood supply for repair in recent years and competition from fishing boats, Foreman Bawa thinks the Jamal will last another two years before it finally rots and falls into the sea. We'll hear more from Nadiman and his family in the second part of the show. But for now, I'm joined in the studio by Panuda Bunpala from the International Labour Organization, by Lawrence Gray from the children's charity World Vision. And also joining us from Jakarta is Mira Hanartani, who's with the Indonesian Ministry of Manpower and Transmigration. Thank you all for joining us. Mira Hanartani, let me begin with you, if I might. The Jamals uh, have been the subject of, of some focus by the Indonesian government, and their numbers have dropped dramatically. But the accusation from a number of quarters is that the attention has now moved away, and there are still a number of these platforms operating, many illegally. What is your intention here? I think the government of Indonesia has uh, shows the, our intention to eradicate this uh, child, child labor uh, in the worst form of child labor. The labor inspection has to do something in in the you know in uh, in the local areas in in in, uh, in Sum Sumatra Utara. So that's uh, we aware that there maybe there is some still there, but it's it's also it depends on also on the go local government to implement and to 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 implement this law. Let me come to you. How does the ILO view the problem in Indonesia and the efforts the government is making to tackle it? Um, Indonesia has a few million uh, children working, and that's not a small group of population to, to deal with. Uh, we have seen progress in terms of uh, government commitment to develop policies and implement programs. <laughs> but we also feel that uh, progress perhaps could be a little bit faster, particularly in some of the areas where the problem is quite easily identified. Such as? Such as uh, what we just have seen, like uh, uh, the, the fishing platforms or even the fishing vessels or fishing boats. 
those are those are the visible problems. Uh, those are uh, hazardous working conditions uh, for the children. Some of those have to be the priorities for action, and there got to be some clear time frame to deal with some of those problems. Lawrence Gray from World Vision, let's bring in a slightly bigger global perspective if we could. A lot of people will look at Asia as perhaps being one of the uh, key parts of the world where child labor is a serious problem. Put it into a bigger context for us. I is Asia worse off than Africa, say, or South America? Uh, and how much progress is being made here as opposed to around the rest of the world? Well, the population of the region suggests that uh, the numbers would be larger in this, in this area than in, in other areas. Certainly other areas have their, their issue. In Asia, there is the economic miracle, there's the, uh, there's the growing uh, presence of China and India, but there's huge disparity as well. Uh, that gives countries great opportunity to take uh, more steps um, uh, as they seek to address some of the social problems. And are they taking those steps? Well, some countries are. India has taken more steps with regard to issues on child labour. We've been working uh, to raise this issue with the communities and with the government. Uh, certainly one point I would like to pick up is that uh, it's not only working with governments, it's also working at the community level on attitudes towards um, what, um, what are in the best interests of children. Children can access school if that's given priority. Uh, so I would, I would emphasise that. Uh, similarly in Indonesia, there are, there's work that would need to happen at community level with attitude as well as uh, looking at law enforcement issues as well. All right. We'll take a brief break there, and when we come back, we'll continue the debate about child labor in Asia, and we'll continue to follow the story of one of the boys from that Jamal. We'll go back to his home village and find out just how he ended up working on a fishing platform.